tell you a tale. I'll tell you a tale. When I was a small child, uh, I had an uncle called Bernard. And Bernard said, I was talking to him about coloured primroses one day. And he said, well, you know how to make primroses change colour, don't you? And I said, no. And he said, well, what you have to do is you have to go into the field or the meadow and you gather up as many cow packs as you can and you put them in the soil, dig a hole and put them in the soil. And then you plant a clump of primroses upside down on top and cover it with soil. And the next year they will come up pink. <laughs> because I fell for this about eight or nine years old. Did it work? No, it didn't work. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 80 of Talking Dirty. Doesn't that have a nice ring to it? Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, super patterned. We've got checks, we've got, I don't know, what are they, planets, Chinese dragons, who knows, planes. He is absolutely bedecked in colour and fabulous as ever. Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. Well, thank you very much for what, that introduction. As for my, my jumper, it's a bit like me. It's everything you want it to be. <laughs> Now, <laughs> beaming with, with great fun and great re- relaxation after a lovely week's holiday um, on the South Coast, we have Thordis Maria Sophia Fredrikston at home in Cambridgeshire. Indeed I am. And we're talking of bringing us everything we want and being everything we want it to be. Our guest today, a regular on Talking Dirty, one of our favourites, is Dan Cooper, always obviously the frustrated gardener but now also of the freshly, newly launched Dan Cooper Garden. How does that feel? Well, it's, uh, yeah, brilliant. (laughs) After (laughs) I'm sort of like popping my eyes open. But yes, absolutely brilliant after um, thinking about it for quite a long time. So yes, very satisfying. We obviously, the last time you were on, talked a bit about the fact that this was germinating. You were growing this company, which is literally launched yesterday by the time this is uh, going out to the world. And uh, it's it's the culmination of like an entire life's passion because you have been so crazy about gardening for so long. But your career has largely been nothing to do with horticulture. And yet you've blogged and you've given us all of these articles and all this great advice and plant recommendations for, what, 10 years. To actually be able to bring your passion and your profession together is, uh, is just the kind of moment lots of us dream of, really. Yes, I do feel incredibly lucky, actually. I, I made the most horrendous deviation, didn't I? <laughs> by um, <laughs> by uh, leaving horticulture gardening as a career and, and going off in another direction, which, you know, these things happen. And, I, you know, I don't regret that for a minute. But um, it has been amazing to have the opportunity to sort of get back into it. Definitely older, certainly wiser. <laughs> But with, you know, the experience that I hope I need to be able to make a success of it, because, you know, retail is pretty tough at the best of times. I think probably having one of its tougher moments right now with everything that's going on in the world and, of course, people shopping increasingly online. So it's, you know, it's a very different retail environment. And I don't think anyone fully understands where it's all going at the moment. I I sort of console myself with the fact that I'm sort of starting at a difficult time so things can only get easier. That must be right. Well, I, I think, personally, I think one of the great things that I find, I mean, I'm itching with anticipation to get on this website and start ordering things because um, I'm a gardener and I'm getting stuff that's being offered by a gardener. So you understand the problems and the practicalities of the various objects and things that you're going to be using, many of which you've used yourself and you've probably tweaked and improved and all the rest of it. And for a start, I just want to say I covered that apron because <laughs> I mean, I'm increasingly frustrated with gardening aprons. I love a gardening apron because when you're lugging bags of wet compost up your front, you know, your thighs get messy, your trousers get messy. You need an apron. It's a practical thing. Um, and it even turns on some of the ladies that come to the garden in the spring, in the summer, when I'm wearing shorts. And they look at me and, the, and they said, have you got anything on underneath that apron? <laughs> I said, well, would you like to lift it and have a look? 
I'm definitely going to have to adjust my product description for this and on the basis of that, Alan. Um... <laughs> I think you need to give us a bit of a twirl uh, because if you're watching the video oh. version, we can only see the top of the apron, but it, there's so much more going I'm on. Have... <laughs> so much more. Um, well, I shall have to uh, arise delicately from my chair, but so, yeah, so there's uh, the, the, um, the straps sort of cross over at the back and tie at the back. If you're slim, which I most certainly am not, then I'm told that they can even get round your front and be tied there. But that's not something that's going to happen with my uh, shapely figure. So um, you, uh, people will also be relieved to know that this bit here is not here on the one that you will buy. It's sort of discreetly down the bottom. But I decided to keep this one because it's quite a nice um, bit of product. Well, Nice it's nice to be branded with your own name, I think, at the top of your apron. <laughs> but not everyone has to go around the garden with that bit there. It will be it will be positioned down in the bottom um, left-hand corner. So then you have got, and I should have demonstrated better, so this handy little bit here is very good for putting snips in. I've got some very nice new wacky snips that fit perfectly in there. <laughs> and uh, so it sort of <laughs> keeps them about your person. And then there's a couple of pockets. Can you see? Yeah. Um, they're not they're not great big fat sort of gaping pockets, but they're 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 good for seeds, sort of um, pencils, plant labels, all that sort of detritus um, that you sort of end up accumulating and is never where, where you want it. So um, so yes, and there is this color, and then there's a very nice sort of army green color if you want to um, blend in a bit more into the background. But um, yes. There we are. Is that are you fully appraised? Of fully the, appraised. The, also, neither yeah. of us really ever do blending in, do we? So uh... <laughs> I know. Well, I'm looking forward to actually bringing in some other colours of this. But I thought I'd, you know, there's one thing I've learned in retail is that I, you know, I could have, I could have done this in red or fuchsia pink, but everyone will go, oh, isn't that lovely, and then buy the green one. So um, <laughs> they will come in due course. I look forward to fuchsia. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned tools I mean I feel like show and tell is normally just for the guest but I think uh, Alan and I have been lucky enough to receive uh, some I think Alan's ne not necessarily got his tool with him because it's too dirty to bring into the house <laughs> <laughs> I've got it so I can show you what Alan has got but, um, we were very lucky to get the most beautifully packaged I mean beautiful tissue paper lovely horticulturally themed uh, present in the post from Dan I and wood wool hmm? wood wool I mean do you yeah. know what I mean when I say wood wool I it's don't you find wood shavings which is used to pack things in I we used to use wood wool, well, years ago, we had a hatchery, um, a chicken hatchery, and we used to use wood wool as, as lining for the boxes that the day old chicks were sent out in. Oh, oh. yes. I mean, you don't see it that much, do you? But it's, no, it's nice no. to have. And it's, it's a natural product. Very useful for lighting the fire as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can get rid of it very easily. You can recycle it with, with a plum. <laughs> Your website, because I've been looking through and coveting lots of things from the apron to the many tools, lots of lovely Nowaki things and lots of useful yeah. things. And and what Alan alluded to is that, you know, you, you do you are an active gardener and you you've got the things that you think are useful and that people want. So thank you. That, I think that's been that's been fairly critical uh, to me as a as a brand, because I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there very few of us need more stuff we just need the right thing for the job that we're trying to do and I I think there is a great tendency to kind of offer everything and think you've got to have loads and loads of stuff but in the end you know we're all busy people we don't have a lot of time if somebody who has some experience can curate something and put together something and tell you that this is the best of the, its kind for that job then I think that that takes a lot of onus off people and it gives people confidence to buy things. What do you call that three-pronged tool that you just had in your hand a little while ago? A claw cultivator. Well no, no I saw that immediately and thought I could have used that yesterday for raking out leaves between perennials when I was going through a border. Tough um, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> You can have one with pleasure, Alan. But, <laughs> but, um, um, cultivator, it, it just makes sense. 
it's it's very very handy as you, you did you did point out one of the things that's actually really great for is just getting debris out of tight spots because yeah. we all we all get that sort of build up of leaves or you know bark or whatever it is and it's quite good for getting that out also just if you want to sort of titivate the surface of the soil if it gets a bit sort of like with all the rain that we'll probably get in April it will get panned down a bit and if you're sowing seeds and things like that you want to sort of break it up a bit and create a nice tilt so it's it's good for that and you know and it doesn't require a lot of power so if if for people that 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 you know, don't have the strongest wrists or, you know, can't put that amount of, of strength into it. It's a it's a good little tool for that. And um, and quite quite sharp tips. So it sort of gets right in there, even on a heavy soil. Yeah, they are sharp. I'll right share with you, <laughs> <Yes>. Alan. Um, <laughs> of course, I mean, there are so many different tools and tables and chairs, seeds. I know that you want to sort of branch out Yes. Of the gardening pun when it comes to the plant offerings but what I'm really excited about is the advice because even though I've probably been gardening for over 10 years I still feel like it's so early on in my gardening journey and to have that really detailed advice I can't even imagine how long it's taken you to put together these articles I mean the frustrated gardener we've got used to your writing style over the last years but the the in-depth side of it but also the kind of at a glance pointers for, for people is um is just absolutely what we need it's i actually really enjoy writing them they they do take an age and i think the reason they take an age is because i i sort of live in fear of of actually giving people poor advice and so i i really do try and check what I'm saying and and it's and it's very hard I think as Alan probably knows when you when you do have such a sort of store of information in your head it's quite hard to distill that um, and not start going into lots and lots of detail and giving lots of anecdotes because that <laughs> that is my tendency and I very much suspect Alan will be the same <laughs> So, so the, the the challenge is always to distill it down. My my non gardening friends, of which I I have more than I have gardening friends, are always telling me not to assume too much knowledge, which is an interesting challenge as well because I have to sort of take a step back. And when I write things like hardening off and um, you know, I can't think of another one now, but uh, that was one that I was, people don't know what hardening off is if they're not a gardener. So you you kind of have to take a step back and think, how do I explain these things that are sort of second nature to me? But yeah, they take a little while, but they are a fundamental part of what I'm trying to do, which is to bring the product and the knowledge together, because there are some, there are some absolutely cracking websites out there for buying products from for your garden and there are some cracking ones for information but there are only a handful I think that are good at both and put everything in one place for a you know a garden lover and I am very much sort of aiming at the garden lover rather than the gardener or or as well as the gardener because there are a lot of people who love their gardens but wouldn't call themselves a gardener necessarily so I want to try and make it a comfortable place for them to come and look for information and things as well so yes a key part and you know I will start with a reasonable amount of content on there but the ambition is that there will be a lot more over time and as the months progress so one of the main things you'll find there every month is a sort of really comprehensive guide about how to enjoy your garden that month so everything from gardening tasks to actually what enjoyment can you get out of your garden because you know we us gardeners tend to get very busy get down to the jobs and sit down very rarely but but each month I'm going to try and uh, highlight what marvels there are in the garden to be enjoyed and and you know when you have those moments of calm you know what to look out for. And I don't think people can really understand how comprehensive these are. It even includes houseplants. So they can only know by going and reading some of these articles. And there'll be several um, already, but there will be loads more. So you just need to go to the Dan Cooper Garden website and read them because we can't really get across 
uh, hear how, how fulsome and, and wonderful they are to read. But you talked of wonderful things in the garden and we've had a little sneak peek at some of your show and tell. Over your shoulder, the coordination is something else, Dan. We expect <laughs> this from you, but you've got this like kind of biscuit coloured wall behind you, a lovely, rich sort of mustardy yellow T-shirt, the daffodils of every tone over one shoulder. And I know you've got some other colourful show and tell off to, off to the side of the screen. So it's, uh, it's quite a vision on the, uh, the video version of the podcast. But what would, you like to, to what would you like to start with? Well, um, the, you, you mentioned the daffodils behind me, and these are all daffodils from the allotment, actually. So what, what we do is we, everything, as, as you know, in our garden is planted in pots, pretty much. And um, we put them in position when they're doing their thing and they look their best. And then we kind of move them quietly out of the way when they're finished so that the leaves can die down naturally. And that can sometimes, with daffodils, take until about June. And then because the bulbs are sometimes a little bit smaller in their second season, particularly if you grow them in pots and you don't sort of feed them um, once they've finished flowering, they can be a little bit smaller. So they, they get transplanted to the allotment for their second year. And so these are all um, from the allotment. We just but sometimes bung them in in big clumps and sometimes can be bothered to put them in rows but <laughs> you know sort of free flowers really and they over a couple more years they bulk up and they become really excellent sized bulbs again daffodils much much better at uh, flowering the, the second year after planting in a pot as opposed to tulips which can be a little bit iffy which we've, we've talked about before haven't we but I am I am um, <laughs> sat in this sort of cloud of fragrance that's almost um, intoxicating because I decided to um, talk about hyacinths today or bring some hyacinths in. And I think one of the things I'd like to do when I get on to selling plants, which to be clear to anyone listening to this, I'm not going to start selling plants straight away because I think we all know what the pitfalls of, of sending plants out in the post are. When I do get there, what I really want to do is try and focus on some of the plants that are perhaps currently less popular, but might be popular again in the future. And we we almost talked about chrysanthemums, didn't we, <laughs> last year? They're, they're already on their way out of the, the doldrums, but there, there are lots of flowers that perhaps aren't as popular as dahlias are at the moment for example that could just do with a bit of a champion so hyacinths will be on my list I, it, they are um you know they're a sort of marmite thing I, I think in a previous conversation Alan very correctly pointed out that they're they're so much more pleasant the second year when the flowers aren't quite so monstrously lollipop shaped <laughs> <laughs> and I was actually a tiny bit disappointed this year when my hyacinth bulbs turned up because they were a little bit on the small side. I have to say that I much, much prefer the display that I've got this year to the one last year when they were like they were like those microphones that you see, you know, <laughs> like a big, long, perfect lozenge. So they're not so much like that. There are the uh, flower stems are a lot more open and, and they're just generally a lot more pleasing but there aren't you know that if, if you know regular gardeners will know that it's the same old varieties that pop up in the catalogue every year I think there is someone in the United States who has a heritage um, collection of hyacinths but they are you know unusual ones are pretty rare and I don't to be I, I don't have any unusual ones here these are all very standard ones but they are absolutely fabulous in pots they flower before the tulips so they they deliver that like wow pop of color as soon as they come out and this I, I wish we could do scent on this fabulous podcast because my garden is literally the minute you come in through the garden gate because we're completely surrounded on every side by fences and walls it traps the scent inside and it's it's amazing and every year I say oh we should plant more hyacinths and for the last couple of years we've done what we said we were going to do and planted more hyacinths and it's really really worth it so I, I should show you some it's time to get the towel because as <laughs> as, as it's customary I will get soaked with water and probably all over my computer keyboard as well so um 
what should we start with? So I think this is probably one of my favourites. Um, oh, it's all slimy and yucky. Look. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why we did it now. So um, you can see what I mean about not being. I say, Dan, can I just interrupt you a minute? This is called talking dirty, you know. So you're all right with a bit of slime. <laughs> I'm all right with a bit of slime. Yeah, a bulb. Um, a bulb grower was telling me the other day about this hyacinth snot, which I've I've not encountered. Have you? Um, no, no, no. no. Apparently, in in the bulb sort of growing world, this is some horrible goo that comes out of the bulbs that um, obviously does concern some people when they see it. But I've I've managed to go forty years without experiencing hyacinth snot. So, <laughs> long may that continue. <laughs> <laughs> but this is uh, this is one of my favourites. I don't think there's any year I don't grow this. So this is Gypsy Queen, um, which is a very nice sort of peachy colour. There's a there's a few sort of tones of pink in it as well. But you can you can see what I mean. The flower head isn't quite as dense as perhaps the ones that you would grow um, indoors, and I think they're better for that. What what you don't really get interestingly with hyacinths like compared to roses or something is there's no real variation in scent I don't think I don't no. really know if you've can your uh, nose can uh, tell the difference Alan but I I think all no. hyacinths pretty much smell the same don't they yeah, yeah they do yeah I, interesting what you said about the, the size of the spike of the flower because when I buy my hyacinths for the garden here. I always buy them from Jay Parker Dutch Bulbs Wholesale, and I always buy, they sell their bulbs in three sizes, one, two, and three, three being the smallest. And I always buy the smallest bulb because I don't want that big fat spire in the garden because it's going to just flop over and, and hit the earth and get messed up anyway um, yeah. and just look a general wreck. So I'd rather buy more bulbs at the cheaper price of the smaller size. Um, and, you know, you don't notice the difference. And another hyacinth that I love, I don't know whether you've heard of it, Dan, it's a blue one called Anastasia, or if you're terribly posh, Anastasia. Um, <laughs> uh, Anastasia, three years ago, was a little bit more expensive than all of the others. Three years ago, we had it in the garden, and now the, where it had a single spire, those bulbs are coming up with three, four, and five much smaller spires on them, and they are absolutely terrific. So if you can get hold of it, Anastasia or Anastasia is a very good one to look out for. <laughs> I get to look out for that. I bet it looks lovely with sort of primroses and yellows. And yeah, it does. Like it does. Absolutely beautiful. Yep. I grow it with um, the purple one called Woodstock. Oh, and the blue wow. and purple look. <laughs> Here comes a Woodstock, everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. I, this is a That's really... my favourite hyacinth. It's a fabulous colour, isn't it? Mm. I mean, you you can't. It's it's I suppose a sort of black currenty, um, sort of royal purple. My beaner on a stick. Yes, exactly. Won't try eating it, but <laughs> it's um, very very striking with yellow. It's good with white as well. Um, and of course, there's so many yellow flowers around this time of year, so it really helps that if, if it goes with yellow. But it's just a lovely, rich colour without being as dark as the one that I showed you last year, which was Dark Dimension, which is so dark that it's very hard to actually see it unless you um, plant it with silver things. And actually, after we had our conversation last year, I promptly went out and um, repositioned all my hyacinths <laughs> next to silver leaved plants on Alan's recommendation. But <laughs> But this this is a good glowing purple and it will really show up in the garden. So very, very nice. And um, and it does come back um, yeah. year after year, this one. If you want something a tiny bit um, lighter than this, Miss Saigon is very nice. That's also a, a very pleasant colour as well. It's a little bit more um, bluey pink, I think, yeah. Than, yeah. than this one. I was going to add something to about Hyacinths. I talked about the size of the bulbs. In the catalogue that I mentioned, J. Parker Dutch Bulbs Wholesale, they actually give you the flowering times of, of hyacinths. So if you want to grow two colours together, you don't want to plant an early one and a late one so they don't overlap. You want to be, be as near as possible. Um, so you get early, mid and late season flowering hyacinths, which is always a useful thing to know. Yes, and it really does extend that sort of period of fragrance as well, yeah. which I think is, is such the, the nicest thing about hyacinths, really. Is well, the other thing I just couldn't say to people, if they do, if, every, you know, all those gardeners out there, we all do lasagna planting now. 
And the one thing you have to do if you want your garden to look smart is to deadhead your hyacinths just as the tulips are coming through because lots of people don't bother. And then you see this sort of these horrible brown dead handkerchiefs flopping over the edge of the container. It looks disgusting. <laughs> yes. And the smell does go off as well. Yeah, it does. I, yes, I, it does. Well, it's not nice once they start to go brown. So you, Dropping you... hyacinths is most unpleasant. <laughs> Exactly. Um, <laughs> the other thing as well is while we're on sort of tips of growing hyacinths, if you do plant them in a pot en masse or in a bulb lasagna, hyacinth bulbs do have this tendency to create an eruption. So if you plant them very, very close together, they'll, they'll push their roots down and their bulbs up. And you can find that they sort of push themselves out of the soil a little bit so if you if you what if you keep them fairly well watered that does stop it to some extent but um it, it, i find that that happens quite a lot probably because i plant sort of maybe 20 in one pot which is which is quite close together well incidentally if people i'm sure most people watching this are all over bulb lasagnas and have been making them for years but if you don't know i'm fairly certain we made a video on it years ago that i can link to in the video versions people want to go watch. i think ian roof might have done one for us so people can go and watch that just in case they don't know or i'm sure if they google you you've probably written several articles about it <laughs> the other thing i'm just going to add about hyacinths while we're still on the subject in case i forget um, sorry, Dan, I don't want to push in, but um, <laughs> at, at Water Beach in Cambridgeshire, there's a chap called Alan Ship. Now, Alan Ship has the National Collection of Hyacinths, and I think that he has certain days when he is open and you can go and you can look at unusual hyacinths. I mean, you know, some people are going to want to have the odd, the unusual. I mean, I know that you would, Dan, and I would too. If there was a green flowered hyacinth, we'd want to grow it, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be a thing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? <laughs> Or one with whiskers on or something, whatever, you know. Um, so if, if anybody wants to go and uh, look at that, do look at Hyacinth National Collection, Water Beach in Cambridgeshire. And the, the guy's name is Alan Ship. It's one of those one of those things that's really sad, I think, in horticulture is that flowers can have these moments of glory and I and and then sort of almost disappear without trace. And I understand, although my um, hyacinth history isn't probably as up to scratch as it should be, my understanding is that there was, that you know, a similar phenomenon to the tulip mania yeah. with, with hyacinths at one yeah. stage and that the bulbs changed hands for vast amounts of money. And there were thousands of varieties of hyacinth. And, and now, as you say, you look at Jay Parker's or whoever else's catalogues and, and you might find there's 12 in there and I, I suspect you know these are the ones that have stood the test of time they multiply readily so the growers get their sort of value for money um but I suspect there are many many older varieties that have much less sort of poised flowers and are, and are very slow to grow that are I think that's one of the things about some of the older varieties that we don't see today and that is that they do require an awful lot of fussing um, and years ago, when there were a prolifer proliferation of large country estates where they had gardeners um, that were able to take care and nurse these hyacinths. I mean, there's a huge cachet. There's one or two available today, well, probably six or seven double flowered hyacinths, which you don't see very much. Now, they actually do require quite um, a large amount of fussing over to, to make them reproduce and to keep them going. And that's what those old gardeners did. Um, but today we don't have the time or the knowledge or the inclination perhaps to do that. No, no. And uh, but but great that people that have the national collections do mm. that work for us, because, you know, what what will happen at some point is that 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 genetically someone will make a, make progress and then those older varieties will become useful again because they will have genes. They will have the double flower gene, for example, or something else that allows them to be sort of crossed back with a modern variety to get exactly something that. amazing. So it's that's so what important always, to the gene pool to keep yes. these things going. That's what, always what makes me sad to think that, um, you know, and it's same to an extent with daffodils, that some, some of these varieties that had amazing attributes have, are just lost now. You know, they can't, they can't be recreated. But um, yes, well, let's not get on. Let's, let's not be sad about hyacinth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to get Woodstock back out again because um, you, uh, you, were you were talking about uh, ones that 
flowered at the same time. And, and this is my tulip colour scheme for this year. So these are the sort of precursor to that. So um, bright pink, uh, bright purples. And this one's, I never know if it's Jan or Jan Boss, but um, I, I suspect quite an old variety. And as you can see, as Alan said, this is one that's flopped over, hence the... Um, the curious shape of the spike, but it looks rather nice, doesn't it? Um, but I, I really like these two together. They're such such sort of 80s colours, aren't they? They're like they look something out of dynasty. But um <laughs> but I do I really love these two together and they 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 flower bang on on cue alongside each other. So that's that's brilliant. And then um I have an, I, that's the sort of jungle garden that have those colours in. And then the other garden at the back is, I call it the gin and tonic garden purely because that's where uh, the sun goes at gin and tonic time, <clears throat> whatever time that might be. Um, <laughs> sunny, all the, sunny all the time here. <clears throat> but um, in spring and spring only, we do stick to sort of gin and tonic-y kind of colours. So green, yellow and white. These are my choices for out there. So we've got um, this one, which is City of Harlem. Again, this has only just started to come out. So hence the rather, rather small spike. But it's, it's a very nice lemon yellow. It's, it's not as sort of harsh and bright as most um, daffodils yellows. So soften things up. It's a bit closer to primrose than it is to sort of daffodil yellow. I, this this one is a good one for just sort of letting it go and it doesn't sort of seem too out of place those other two colors obviously quite bright and then um whites this one's carnegie as you can see absolutely whopping uh great flowers on on this one whites you know again not not difficult to place in the garden this time of year doesn't scream out too much but um beautiful big flowers and as you can see from the smaller bulb that it's not quite as solid so but yeah they all smell exactly the same there's no no real difference between them but uh, they tend to be the this sort of very rainbow of colors there's there's not many subtle nuances are there <laughs> alan really in, in higher sense they're they're uh, color and bustling. yeah i think you just give me an idea for my uh, one, one of the things I have is a, is a lead cistern, which you see from a long way away when you first come to the garden and you look down this uh, path into the garden. It's at the end of this path is this large cistern. And I'm going to put John Jan Boss or Jan Boss and Woodstock in there together next year because it's oh. such a statement that the moment I have in there my tribute to Ukraine, which is yellow and blue polyanthus, which I grew quite a lot of this year. And, as, and way before we knew what was going to happen in the Ukraine, yeah. and I suddenly thought the, the squirrels have been digging in there and sort of eaten a lot of the tulip bulbs. So I whipped the whole lot out, and replanted them in the garden and just stuck blue and yellow in there. But next year, hopefully it'll be more peaceful and we'll have young boss and Woodstock. Yes, let's hope so. That would be that would be a good uh, outcome, wouldn't it? But hmm. um, yeah, they're certainly it, very very striking. I think those and a tulip like Attila Graffiti or something like that uh, that sort of will carry on the the Jan Boss or Jan Boss colour would be would be fabulous. This has been a complete revelation to me. I'll be honest. I have spent. Do you ever have that thing where you you want to like a plant but you don't really? So I, I always, I'm forever, <laughs> yes, forever. I'm, I do, you know, I'm doing. You just hit the nail on the head, Thunder, because I'm doing it at this very moment with camellias. I mean, camellias, those big blobs of bright colour. Um, I planted masses of them 20 to 30 years ago in the garden, and they're now some of them are tree-like proportions. And although I have a sneaking respect for them, I have to say that in my head, I really don't like them. <laughs> I think that that sums up. I love the scent of hyacinths and I've, I've forced them before and had them in the house so that I can enjoy them in the house. But I don't know, maybe because my a lot of my pots are in the shade. So I don't have I, I think they really work in containers, but I never quite know how to use them in the garden. And I I think you're right, Alan, a sneaking respect and, and a love of certain aspects of them. But I've never really used them. But I think you have inspired me that maybe next year, either side of my front door, two of the only sunny containers I have, I think they might they might be quite nice there. 
Yeah. And I think the other thing, as Alan said, is to just let them go native a bit because they lose that awful sort of stiffness and rigidity once they start to um, form smaller bulbs and put up little more, more sort of bluebell like spikes, really. It's actually, it's, it's rather like weaning, weaning an athlete off um, um, steroids <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to get that kind of spelt fixed figure back rather than that overblown, over muscly, butch, lumpy thing. I think familiarity breeds contempt with a lot of plants, doesn't it? I think yeah. gladioli probably have suffered yep. some of the same. You know, they just become ubiquitous, stiff um, plants that, that that get bad associations for people. Chrysanthemum's exactly the same. You know, it's mm. just get, get petrol station for. I was going to say supermarkets and petrol stations <laughs> don't do them any favors, Dan. <laughs> but it doesn't, that's not the flower's fault. That's oh. our fault for putting it in that, that context. And actually, and, and then of course, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the growers then grow more that look like that because that's what they think everybody wants. And they, they sort of become dumbed down, if you like. But, yeah. um, you know, they, everything has its place, doesn't it? And I, th I think it is, um, Hyacinths are, 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 you know, there are there are some very early flowering ones. So you you can really get a big sort of you know, block of like really nice bright colour that almost seems too early for the season, and of course the scent as well, which you you just can't. I mean, I, I I'm sure there are people who don't like the scent of hyacinths. <laughs> just there are that don't like the scent of lilies, but you know, it is it is a it's a very evocative scent, I would say. And you... It is very evocative. I think it's a scent that, that is, personally for me, I can't bear it indoors because it's too cloying. I can't bear lilies indoors either. But in the garden, I don't mind because you get a whiff as you pass. You don't have to be enforced with it. And jasmine's <laughs> a bit like that as well. We've got jasmine polyanthem and flowering its head off in the Pelagonium house at the moment in the garden here. And when you open the door, it takes your breath away. And it really is too heavy. And you need to open all the doors and the windows and let the scent dissipate a little bit before you actually force yourself to go into the house. <laughs> yeah. I think actually, Alan, you just, just struck me that you got it spot on when you were talking about Woodstock and looking like Ribena on a stick. In the highest scents are a flower that needs diluting and yeah. you know yeah. so you're talking about the fragrance you know you don't want you don't want neat hyacinth <laughs> um <laughs> you want you know a whiff of the fragrance and you want a, a freer sort of flower not the concentrated sort of lollipop shape but um anyway each to its own I love them and I, every year I do plant more of them they're they're very easy and as and so the the same for these as um, the daffodils. I, in fact, I put a picture on Instagram yesterday, but all the um, sort of ex hyacinths go and get planted in rows at the allotment. And they're so cheerful. They take up very little space. And, you know, in a row or a block, it doesn't matter if the flowers aren't particularly big because you still get some nice color. And bees love them as well, which I probably should have mentioned. And you're taking on the theme, Dan, which is what everybody's wanting to do, and that's to grow more of their own cut flowers. Yes. Um, and I was thinking about this the other day because last year, a friend of mine called Gilbert, who used to work for us before he retired, he has some, well, two particular plants on his allotment. One came from me and the other uh, is an iris that he grew called, a barbarous iris called Iris latifolius, which they refer to in the catalogue as the English iris. But that's rubbish because, I mean, it comes from the Pyrenees. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> you can only get them in two colours today in Parker's catalogue. There's a rich blue and a white. Um, and the, the gladiolus is, um, we, you know, we just, you just touched on the, the vulgarity, shall we say, of certain gladiolus. But there's some, some sort of species ones. And I've got one from South Africa called gladiolus cardinalis, which is a species type. But it is the most vulgar red and white flower you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it flops nicely. So if you plant it in a raised bed and it will sort of flop forward or grow through other things. And what Gilbert does on his allotment, he lines these out in rows, the iris and the gladiolus for cutting for his wife. Um, and he digs them up regularly and he sorts through the bulbs and grades them. And as they make more, he grows the smaller ones on in a separate row and puts the bigger ones back to provide flowers for next year. And this is what everybody could do with their 
hyacinths and with their daffodils and narcissi. Um, not tulips, I wouldn't say so much because tulips, there are very few tulips that really stand the test of time and last. Um, and I think probably they need some kind of heat treatment. For, I understand from Richard, a friend of mine, that um, some, some members of the Tulip Society where they grow those old fashioned broken tulips or Rembrandts, where they've got split colors, all of which are virused, and they lift their bulbs, they put the bulbs somewhere exceedingly warm and leave them there for about a month to, uh, to help initiate the flowering the following year. I don't know quite how it works, but that's what they do. Well, I wonder whether that, I mean, my grandfather would have oiked all the tulips out and then put them on the greenhouse staging and let them all dry out. And I wonder whether that that might have a similar sort of effect. And the that, heat, yeah, on the bulbs. Yes, that really, you know, quite, quite significant heat might actually um, impact them. But you have just you have just led me on to a shameless plug, which is um, <laughs> about <laughs> bulbs, because um, I am going to launch some bulb collections, not not immediately, not straight away. So they won't be there today, but a um, little bit later on in the month. And one of the bulb collections is uh, seven varieties of tulip, which are all reliably perennial. Um, please don't ask me to reel them off now. But um, <laughs> Dan, not, not only are you a shameless plugger, but you're also very good at initiating an ask back because we're now going to have to want to know. <laughs> and I'm not going to remember. <laughs> so what I've done is it's a rainbow of colours. So you've got one from each colour of the rainbow. I think, um, let me try and remember some of them. So Purissima is in there. Uh, Queen of Night is in there. Negrita. There's an there's an Apple Dawn, at least one Apple Dawn in there. But I think most people, you know, know that those are pretty good perennial tulips. Um, I can't remember what the orange one is called. It's an, oh, Triple A um, is the orange one. But they, they've all been chosen specifically because they will come back year after year whereas as you say the vast majority won't so that was quite fun putting that together and interestingly I, I, I can't say that all of them do but I, I'm pretty sure the majority have AGMs as well from that list so they have sort of been tried and tested. That's an important point but for people that don't know an AGM stands for the Award of Garden Merit and that means that it's been judged by the uh, Royal Horticulture Society and, and all these eminent plants people. And they judge on the qualities of the plant, not just how good it looks, but also its longevity, um, the way, it, you know, its vigour, for instance, and all of that kind of thing. So if you get four tulips to cho and you choose the one with an AGM, you should, not necessarily will, but you should be getting the best of the bunch. Yes. I mean, it's a it's a really, really good guide, isn't it, for people that, um, yeah. well, it's a good guide for anybody, because actually sometimes it's a toss up between do I go for this one or that one. I think occasionally it's the case that if it's a newer variety, the RHS don't trial everything all the time. They do very specific trials each year and some of them go on for years don't they Alan um, yeah, they do. to, to be like able to buy a rear trial we're doing at the moment it's the most boring thing you've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> but somebody's got to do it hey <laughs> well now, now is, it, is it what can we learn from it so far is there anything I've, I I think you have just hit on one of my plants like plants that I know I probably ought to like, but I really don't. And I, yeah, that, I think is, the problem. that is because my grandma was obsessed with that gold leafed one that has bright pink flowers. Yeah. And I, I didn't like it when I was a child and I still don't like it now. We, I, my, and my parents had one. I don't know very much about spireas, so you can correct me, but is it called bridal veil or something? There's one that sort of comes. Bridal wreath, I think they used to make, wreath, they used, yeah, they used yeah. to sort of make headdresses at the flowers for brides and bride, bridesmaids and things like that. Um, but they're fleeting shrubs. I mean, some of them are quite nice. Um, in the fact that they're, they're now coming with autumn colour. They've, they've been doing an awful lot of continental breeding with them. But they're still boring. <laughs> <laughs> boring and sort of sticky. I don't know quite how to describe it. Not sticky well, as in tacky. Yeah, but shall we just say that they all have the face for radio? <laughs> <laughs>
I'm similar about that and also about Deutzia as well, which uh, which has a pretty yucky smell, as I recall. But they, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, it goes back to this whole thing. It's about associations because I just... I, I think of them in my parents' garden, getting very tall and woody and not very well pruned and just being shrubs where everything's going on up here and not very much down there. And <laughs> anyway, we should be kinder to them. If, they, if plants, are, most plants well grown, they look, they look all right, so. They look better than we remember them. <laughs> yes, but yes, AGM, really, really useful. And um, I think, as you, as you say, that goes back to these things that you can't take for granted that people know what that means, but mm. um, it's a very useful thing to know that. It's a useful guide, I think. Mm. So we're doing a collection of tulips, what else? <laughs> so I've got, I'm mainly focusing on tulips and daffodils for year one. So they're limited edition collections and I've put together things that I think um, work particularly well in certain situations. So I've got daffodils for pots and tulips for pots. Um, and then there are two collections themed around my two very small gardens. So there's a jungle garden theme, which has um, some beautiful uh, crown imperials um, and it's all sort of orange and black tulips. And then um, have a gin and tonic themed collection as well, which has yellow crown imperials and, and some really cracking um, yellow and white tulips like Exotic Emperor and trying to think what they all are now. I can't remember all the names, but, <laughs> but one's Purissima, of course, but all ones that um, I grow. And I've got, I've got quite a lot of new ones coming up this year. So there's a quite a promising yellow one called muscadet I don't know why it's called that because it doesn't muscadet doesn't say yellow to me at all but um yeah so I'm going to see a uh, trialing lots of new ones in the garden this year to see how how good they are but I'm always going to have a bit of a focus I think on what grows well in containers because that's that's what I can assess most easily and I'm and I, I want people whatever size of garden to be able to grow them really I think that most people actually want um, tulips, hyacinths and all the things that we've just been talking about for specifically for containers, because uh, you get this time of the year, there's not huge amounts of colour. Um, mm. But there is, of course, if you look for it and it depends on on your garden and the way it's planted. But to get those wonderful zingy pops of colour, that's I mean, just look at Jan Boss and Woodstock together. That's a pop of colour if ever there was. I mean. I'd never thought of putting those two together. And I don't know why I haven't, but I hadn't. It just hadn't occurred to me. So, Dan Cooper, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. The other great thing about, about bulbs is that you the, the timing of when they die down and when you can take them out of the pots just about coincides with when you can put the next sort of lot of things in. So, you know, tulips may or may not decide to keep those but um the irony though the irony is alan that so last year we grew a whole allotment bed full of tulips it looked like a little miniature bulb field and we dug all the tulips up and in a similar way to we would with the ones in the pots just decided we didn't want them anymore our allotment neighbor archie who is 80 and has been a professional gardener for his whole life said that he'd take them all off our hands and lo and behold of course they're all flowering and he's looking forward <laughs> to a magnificent display and even the bulbs that he thought were too small to be planted in his garden at home he lobbed them all into a pit I think on one corner of his allotment every single one's got a bud on it so <laughs> <laughs> you know dan what they say you win some you lose some <laughs> but if you can see them you're still winning yeah we can still see them and they're giving someone pleasure so that exactly. that's all that matters yeah <laughs> uh well as ever dan loads of inspiration you always bring along such amazing show and tell and uh and it has been i think really good for me to sit here and cover some hyacinths i think i needed that in my life <laughs> They've probably not had so much airtime on anything for years. So, well, I, I tell you what, though, this is great listening to people when they've actually, when they've physically grown them and they've watched the results and they've tried and they've tested them. And this is what 
your Dan Cooper gardening really is all about. I'm going to shamelessly plug it now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're probably going to want Flomo's Thunder, are you? Oh, well, I am. And it's interesting. I mean, I now have got some hyacinth flomo which i i never thought i would be saying so thank you dan flomo by the way if you don't know is that sort of fear of missing out you get about a flower or a plant i always get a lot of it from you dan in fact before we uh, sat down to record this i thought i would look back through some of our previous podcasts with you and um when we put this podcast together and we're getting all the photos together, I end up spending quite a lot of time looking at people's Instagram accounts. And so I was trawling through lots of different photos. And uh, I don't know if it was last year or the year before you shared tropium tricolor or tricolor, however we want to say it, with tropiolum brachycerus, however we yeah. say it, a yellowy one in combination with that sort of tropical fish combination of red and purple and yellow and the two of them together I'm not sure I've seen them combined before and it was so spectacular I don't actually have um tricolor so I, I I can't attain it at all at the moment but what a lovely combo do you still have it I do yes it's not started doing its thing yet but I do and actually um it, it was it was the last time we spoke that Alan reminded me to go and find my uh, tropiolum tricolor because, as as he correctly predicted, there were little threads uh, wandering out from the pot already. But yes, I've got them both, and uh, they're looking very happy. I kind of have to sort of nudge them into a little bit of shelter. It, it gets very windy here. Um, they don't particularly like being buffeted about, but I I don't find that they're too worried about the cold but when I um when I split my tricolor up because it has these very sort of long uh thin red uh tubers I will um pop some in the post to you because it's very easy to easy to propagate well last time I was at Alan's garden he had three big flowering tripods and uh, it was very tempting to buy one but fortunately they were so popular by the time I uh, had come back round they'd all been bought <laughs> 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 within the space of about an oh. hour of the garden being open so uh i'm gonna try i'm gonna try them outside next year because i never have and and the way the winters are becoming uh milder i think it's worth a risk but i mean choose your spot very carefully mm. um as you said dan they don't like being buffeted about too much by the wind so choose a spot which is as sheltered as you can and also somewhere that perhaps is a little bit dry i mean a rain shadow in a corner somewhere um and if you if you've got a um, just let's say a climbing rose or whatever, uh, plant them so that they can weave their way up through that because the, the branches above them, we doing their weaving, will give them shelter. Mm. You said they're easy to propagate. Uh, in our latest Talking Dirty newsletter, go and sign up on our website if you aren't uh, signed up already. But we were sort of talking about if you can, if you've got a spare one, definitely worth uh, you know, testing their hardiness in, in different places because hopefully you will have success with it. Um, and also, this is all we always have to talk about tropiolums because every time you're on, Dan, I have to update you on my tropiolum pentaphyllum, which you assured me was very weedy. It is. It's currently <laughs> as triffid like as it's ever been in my uh, bathroom. And it's about to flower right by the mirror that I look at in the morning, which is very exciting. <laughs> there are upsides to not having a greenhouse. <laughs> Yes, I mean, and it is a it is a flower that deserves to be looked at quite closely because it's got kind of speckles, I remember. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I love it. I'm very excited. Um, aside from those Flomos, um, because I've just been on holiday and I have been everywhere taking photos of, well, primulas, because I can never get enough of, of even just primula vulgaris and its seedlings, but also narcissi. And thank you very much to people on Instagram who've been trying to help me identify various ones I've spotted uh, out and about we think one I photographed was Mrs Langtree which is a pre-1869 heritage one which I think I might be able to get hold of a few bulbs of and is absolutely beautiful very delicate and also Barrett Browning which has got a little small orange trumpet and white petals and I love a short orange trumpet on a, a narcissus so I think they've been added to my my daffodil flomo list which is very very long and full of quite expensive variety <laughs> 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 yes I've got the stamps catalogue is it sits on the sofa and every evening I sit down and ah there we are yeah every evening I sit down and look at it and think oh yeah some of them are some of them are pricey aren't they but yeah, I love the um I take it to the local churchyard with me 
so weird um <laughs> because we've got this incredibly interesting uh graveyard there which has been extended over well nearly a thousand years I think um block by block in a big long row towards Margate and so you can pretty much date the daffodil variety to the age of the gravestones and by doing that we've and using the scamps catalog and other catalogs we've been able to work out what quite a few of them are it's quite a fun game so exciting yeah Mm. I, I'm not quite, I don't feel like I am, um, well, I haven't done that yet. I think I might have to. <laughs> in Cylinder, in the historical variety section, I saw the Picton Garden posting that one the other day, and I think that might have to be um, purchased pre-1921, one that one, a little bit, a bit crazy looking. Well, a couple know. up from that is Van Sion, which... Yes. Um... <laughs> you have spent a lot of time <laughs> in this catalogue. <laughs> yes, I know. Um <laughs> And that uh, we found growing on top of the cliffs um, here in Broadstairs last week, actually. And and that's going right back to the hyacinths again. You see that and you really do wonder why that's not a more popular daffodil, because actually there's not a lot I would say that you could improve on. It's quite short. It's got these um, almost sort of curling round, sort of moustachey kind of um, outer petals and then a very double trumpet. It's a really neat flower. I can only assume that it must multiply incredibly slowly so it's not sort of commercially a great variety, but um, it's the cutest thing. And you would think that, and I'm not really a double daffodil person, but... um, you you would think if that was that was readily available now it'd be really popular when i was a child growing up we had an orchard of um, mainly apples and pears and van sion was planted throughout the orchard um and it it did really really well and when i when we came here to east russell old vicarage and there was hardly any plants in the garden but there was a little clump planted on the south side of the house of van sion and it's still there today this year the clump had 13 flowers on last year it had none so I think it's telling me, please dig me up and, and, <laughs> and rescue me. Right, yeah. yeah, so I need to dig and divide it. But no, you're absolutely right. Very old, but still extremely lovely. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh, Dan, where are you at with your Flomo? Uh, obviously, quite a lot of scamps catalogue Flomo. Yes, there's lots of that. I, I don't think I've done this correctly this time. So there's one Flomo that is, I have satisfied and, I've, and I, I nearly Ooh. forgot that I've, I've got it here. But... Well, that's really interesting because this is something I want to spend a bit more time on uh, in future is this idea of Flomos that you found. And I put it in the last newsletter. What shall we call it? Shall we start a hashtag? And I quite like <laughs> hashtag Flomo no more. And uh, and then we can try and sort of highlight some of them um, on uh, in the newsletter every month, because I think the feeling when you find your Flomo is so exciting, particularly if it happens out of nowhere at a nursery or a plant sale or you know, an event um, or a kind gift. So uh, I think we should start hashtag Flomo no more and yes. you can start it with your plant. It's my Flomo no more. Oh, <laughs> I had to bring it in from the garden. So... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Jacobinia porciflora, the Brazilian fuchsia. So um, it doesn't really look like it belongs in this time of year, does it? It looks like it should be late summer, autumn, but um, it flowers around now. And um, I've wanted it for a long time, but always thought that it was just too fiddly, too tender, whatever. As as you can see, it's not unhappy at all in my garden it hasn't hasn't spent any time indoors um and absolutely covered in those uh little sort of tiny flowers i don't know how close i can get for you and you can see them i just love tubular flowers it's got a bit of a courier thing going on yeah yes and i love couriers as you know so it does kind of go quite well the 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 color of this is much stronger because i don't think you get yellow in uh couriers but um you do Do you? Do you? Uh, yeah, oh, I'm very right. pale yellow. It is quite a pale yellow. It's primrose yeah. yellow. Yeah. Um, but I've got a little dwarf one that I think came from um, Potterton's, I think, um, nursery in uh, uh, in Lincolnshire. And I got it about four years ago and planted it outside. It's on a raised bed in the sunk garden. It's flowering its head off. So it, uh, I'm pleased with that. But this Jacobinia porciflora is a plant that 
I think probably uh, I remember that being grown in, in as an indoor plant. Mm. Um, and it, it used to come out of the greenhouse and come into the house when it was in flower, but it didn't require too much heat, even, even way back then. <laughs> no, I kind of quite like that little category of shrubs that are just, um, they're a little bit tender, but they don't require, yeah. you know, they, they can take a fair amount of cold. I think couriers are, are the same. Victorians thought they were a conservatory plant and then they're, That's they're right. borderline. Um, so, and then I then I am really saving myself because on Sunday, although this is the most ludicrous thing to do um, when launching a new business, on Sunday I'm going to Cornwall, which is quite a long way away, um, for the Cornwall Garden Society Spring Flower Show, which oh. is my favourite flower show of them all, because it's so... Um, just sort of otherworldly, really. And it could only happen in Cornwall because the weather allows for a lot of flowers to be out that might not be out elsewhere in the country. So I'm um, really looking forward to that. And however much I go with the intention of not buying a single thing, <laughs> it, it, it ain't going to happen. There, there will be all sorts of marvels there that I will be... Um, I will be drawn into buying, I'm sure. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's best that you just try and not think about your Flomos before you go to an event <laughs> like that, because it could end up being an expensive and car filling affair. And then you have to deal with them all when you're launching your business. So try and show the kind of self-restraint that I'm not familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. Right, Alan, where are you at with your Flomo? Well, before I go into my Flomo, I'd just like to, to talk about plant names but one particular plant name and that's a rhododendron and I don't buy many rhododendrons because we're so dry here um, but I did buy this one and it's called Christmas cheer now wouldn't you assume from that that it's because it blooms very early yeah wrong <laughs> wrong it doesn't bloom very early at all it's it's just a, well it opened its flowers about a fortnight ago it's a it's a soft sugary pink take it or leave it you know <laughs> But the reason I discovered that it was called Christmas cheer because it was gently forced to bring into your house for Christmas time. And, you know, if, unless you know that, you're easily misled by the fact that you think you've been done. I've just spent £15 on a plant that I thought was going to be in flower for Christmas, and it's not. But there you are, discovering something. My Flomo, back to, back to business, my Flomo. Well, my Flomo is nothing to do with flowers. I'm awfully sorry to tell you. Um, <laughs> I've always been a bit of a renegade and I'm going to do it again. And my flomo is going to be a Dan Cooper apron. But I now know that the badge will not be on my front here. So people will come up to me and say, hello, Dan, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing I'm going to want is a claw cultivator. So I'm, they're going to be my um, my tomos. <laughs> 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 my garden tools flomo um, and they are two of the most useful things i've seen in a long time so dan thank you very much for that thank you for the, all the hard work you put in on your website i can only say that us and all the people that we probably watch us i know thunder fairy will be wishing you all the very very best with your new venture and long may it continue and we look forward to having you back to talk about your bulb collections lovely that sounds good no, thank you i mean everyone has been so supportive so I really hope I kind of live up to everyone's expectations <laughs> now and deliver something great well from our sneak peeks uh, by the time this goes out everyone can just go and look at it and see it won't be a sneak peek anymore they won't <laughs> need to put a password in though I kind of want to just do that because it felt so special um <laughs> it's it's an absolute triumph and I can only you know I can't really wait to see how much more it develops over the coming months and years and of course you'll be back as I said, yes. one of our faves, <laughs> with your towel on your lap. Yeah. <laughs> Faithful kitchen towel. <laughs> but until next time, the very best of luck uh, with the beginning weeks and months of Dan Cooper Garden, and we will see you shortly. Happy gardening, Thank everybody. You. Happy gardening, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm, Dan's coming in. I'm yeah. just going to get coffee. <laughs> Dan arrives, Alan leaves. <laughs> <laughs> he does always seem to leave at some point during one of your podcasts. <laughs> Dan, is that apron one of yours? Yes, it is. Shameless, isn't it? <laughs> On this fabulous podcast. 
called Per Podcast because there's a blooper for you. Um, <laughs> Dean, Dean R. Croucher on Instagram lives like five, ten minutes from where we stay and he spotted where I was. He was like, well, if you pop round, I've got some aeoniums for you. And uh, I thought you might like to see. Oh, lovely. I'm and very, I'm very excited. So it's incredibly generous. If this makes it into the bloopers, thank you, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Went to the post office this morning, so it. Oh to... goodness, that was that was very committed. I bought mine in just in case. Oh. <laughs> I've been scratching things out my crack ever since it arrived. <laughs> Everybody needs a tool to do that. <laughs> <laughs>